I used to play with them. They sit there and just do shots. And before we get to uh, our guests, let you know that I appreciate all of your willingness to come out and better understand the issue that we're about to have debated in front of us this evening. Uh, we have with us Dan McGrath from the Minnesota Majority, uh, as well as Doran Schrantz, who will be representing our vote, our future. Uh, moderating this debate is going to be Bill Salisbury uh, from the Pioneer Press. I'm more of a Star Tribune guy myself. <laughs> At least I'm reading the paper. So again, thank you everyone for coming out. Please give yourselves a round of applause and we'll go ahead and get this started. Good evening and welcome to Debate Minnesota's uh, Voter ID Constitutional Amendment Debate. I'm Bill Salisbury, a political reporter for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, and I will be your moderator tonight, and thank you all for being here. In 2004, a man named Will Hadwin founded Debate Minnesota. He was a friend and colleague of mine, and a true student of political history. Will and the people uh, he asked to serve on the Debate Minnesota board were from different backgrounds and political persuasions, but they all shared a concern about the impact of negative advertising and money in politics and the lack of civility in our political discourse. Debate Minnesota proposes that we take a lesson from Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas and carry our issues back to the public square, where the real power lies in this nation with the people. And as with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, we believe that the best way to restore civility in the election process is through content-rich discussions. I propose that we dedicate tonight's debate to Will Haviland, who died last week, as a way of honoring the noble mission he envisioned. On November 6, Minnesota voters will decide whether to switch from having no voter identification requirement to adopting one of the strictest ID laws in the nation. As retired Judge Jack Davies wrote in the Star Tribune opinion piece on Wednesday, voting on a constitutional amendment isn't like choosing between candidates for a two or four or six year term. It's adopting state policy that's likely to last for generations. Jack wrote, constitution making is serious business. Here to debate the proposed voter ID amendment tonight, our proponent Dan McGrath, the executive director of Minnesota Majority, who is speaking on behalf of the organization Protect My Vote, and opponent Doran Schrantz, executive director of the Isaiah Project, speaking for the group Our Vote, Our Future. Uh, we will begin the debate with two minute opening statements. Uh, then I will ask questions, and, and uh, the, uh, the debaters will have. Uh, two minutes to answer each question, followed by one up follow, one minute follow up. Um, we uh, had a coin toss before uh, we came in tonight, and Ms. Schrantz won the coin toss, um, so she will start. Uh, we will rotate the questions throughout the night, and finally, at the end, each candidate will have a chance to make a two minutes uh, closing statement. Before we start, I want to thank our student timekeepers here in front uh, tonight for helping us helping keep us on schedule and on track. And I want to ask the members of the audience, uh, please do not cheer, jeer, or applaud until we until the conclusion of tonight's debate. So, uh, Ms. Schrantz, would you give the first thank opening you. statement, please? Thank you. At first, the voter restriction amendment might look like common sense reform, but the more Minnesotans really look under the hood of this ill-conceived amendment, we see that it's actually an extreme makeover of our election system. If this amendment passes, it's gonna do three things. One, it's gonna cost Minnesotans a lot. Two, it will create a complex two-tiered voting system and make absentee voting and election day registration difficult, if not impossible. And three, it will have serious unintended consequences of potentially locking out hundreds of thousands of eligible voters, including seniors and active duty military. First, it will impose another unfunded mandate 
on our already strapped local governments. Nonpartisan officials from Minnesota have estimated that it may cost up to $150 million to implement, meaning we are going to pay for it out of higher property taxes when we are not paying for it out of our own pocket. And while the proponents of photo ID say that IDs are free, we all know that in government there is no such thing as free. Second, it will cost so much because it's so complicated. The amendment creates a complex two-tiered voting system that we have never seen before. It also eliminates same-day registration as we know it and places huge hurdles in the way of absentee voting. Third, it fails to safeguard the rights of thousands of eligible voters. And these, uh, this will fall most heavily on active military, senior citizens, greater Minnesotans, young people, people of color, and working families, and that is every Minnesota family. The legislators who wrote this poorly writ written amendment, they lacked common sense. They got it wrong. And Minnesotans should vote no. Mr. McGrath, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Mel. Uh, thank you, Debate Minnesota, for bringing this together at Metro State University for uh, hosting it. I think this is a great venue and a great opportunity to discuss the issue. Every industrialized nation on Earth with the exception of several of the United States, requires identification to vote. It's a common sense thing. The majority of the world recognizes how simple and obvious it is to require identification to vote. We use ID to protect ourselves against fraud when it comes to banking. How many of you would keep your money in a bank that did not require identification to make withdrawals? No one would say that the bank is trying to deprive them of their right to their money by asking for identification before handing it over to you. The voter ID amendment does four simple things. It requires voters in person to provide photographic identification when voting. It requires the state to make identification available at no charge. It requires a second chance ballot called a provisional ballot in case someone is unable to present photo identification on election day for whatever reason. <clears throat> It also requires all voters be treated substantially the same in how we verify their identity and eligibility. I think everyone would agree that we should treat people as much the same as is possible, even if we're using different processes uh, to vote. Everything else about the amendment that you'll be hearing, that you have been hearing, is wild speculation at best. If it's not in the amendment, it's not going to happen. It's that simple. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the questions. And uh, uh, Mr. McGrath, we'll start with you. Um, is voter fraud a real problem in Minnesota? Well, Minnesota is currently leading the nation in convictions for voter fraud. We have not seen the number of convictions from a single election in any state in this country since 1936 in Missouri. 200 people have been convicted for voter fraud in the 2008 election, which is a record for the state of Minnesota and a record for the country since 1936. In addition to that, we have over 6,000 election day registrants from 2008 that are currently flagged for challenge on the voter rolls because they provided names or addresses that didn't check out after the fact. Their ballots have been counted, but we don't know who cast them. We don't know where they live or if they're even real people. Ms. Schrantz, do you disagree? Is, is voter fraud an issue in Minnesota? Well, first of all, any allegations of voter fraud or ineligible voting need to be taken very, very seriously. It is essential that our election system have utmost 100% integrity. But the reality is that the accusations of large-scale voter fraud that Minnesota majority alleges are simply not true. Um, Minnesota has, the majority has made these allegations, and they have been widely debunked by independent analysts, by local officials. People have looked up and down. And in particular, let's look at the postal verification cards. The postal verification cards are actually a part of a 10-point safeguard system that our election system has. All of that system is meant to establish eligibility at every step along the way. The postal verification cards are actually to establish residence, and it is a routine procedure that the state does to clean the voter rolls, to identify and flag where there might be problems, 
to actually um, make update registrations and to ensure that our registrations are actually as accurate as possible. So the signs of postal verification cards going out is actually a sign of this whole uh, system of 10 safeguards actually working. Uh, secondly, the 6,000 number that uh, Mr. McGrath is using is, ac using is actually over a period of 12 years. So it's not true that in 2008 there were 6,000 cards returned. <coughs> Many of those cards that returned were actually the result of postal carrier error. They were the result of, in a decade, you know, people move, people die, their addresses change. So this is actually a sign, and I'll close, um, that the system is working. It's one of the many ways that we have to safeguard our elections and establish the eligi eligibility of all voters in Minnesota. Mr. McGrath, you've got a minute for a rebuttal. Uh, in reality, the 6,224 return postal verification cards that have led to voters being flagged for challenge to the voter registration system were all the result of election day registrants who used that system and voted in 2008. In actuality, from that election, there were over 23,000 return postal verification cards. The reason that the card was returned is noted in the system. We can identify those that are not returned for suspicious reasons, such as the voter has moved, postal error, etc. And eliminating those non-suspicious PVC card returns leaves us with 6,224 highly suspect, unverifiable voters. Ms. Schrantz, you have a minute to respond. I'll just say again that just pulling out the postal verification cards is like looking at one small part of a huge system that is intended to safeguard our elections. It is meant to establish residency, which is one of the five points that establishes eligibility to vote. There is no evidence that the postal verification cards returning is the sign of anything sketchy happening or any problems. The, the accusations that, that that is the case are just simply not true. Um, you seem to have a basic disagreement over here, of, of, of here which is more important, fraud or, or access to voting. So I want to ask you, which, uh, and we'll start with you, Ms. Schrantz, uh, which is the bigger threat to Minnesota's election system, fraud or lack of access to voting? The first thing to understand about uh, the allegations of fraud is to put it in perspective. There have been widespread allegations of fraud. Uh, because of these allegations, people uh, have researched whether or not it's actually happening. Because in order for our election systems to work, we absolutely do have to establish the integrity of our elections. The Brennan Center for Justice looked over a period of a decade to see are there any cases of voter impersonation fraud happening in America. In a decade, there were 647 million votes cast. There were 13 credible cases of in-person voter fraud that happened in 13 years, and not a single one of those cases happened in Minnesota. So the question that we should be asking is not what's more important, voter fraud or eligibility, but how do the, or people having access to the system, but how do those pieces actually work together? We need a system that actually ensures the eligibility of all voters and reaches out and grabs all eligible voters and makes sure that they get pulled in. We need both of those things working together. And right now, Minnesota has a system that works exactly like that. It works very well. And the more that I've looked into the system and uh, the 10 points, the way that we check it every step of the way, that it's not only step checked during an election year, it's checked uh, actually daily. We have a system in Minnesota that we can have confidence in, and only looking at one side of it is a mistake and could have a serious unintended consequences. Mr. McGrath, do you think uh, fraud or lack of access to voting is, is a bigger threat to our reproduction system? Well, I think that the idea that we can only address access or only address fraud is a false dilemma. Uh, there's no reason that we can't make it easy to vote and hard to cheat, and that's what this voter ID amendment sets out to do. Uh, we should have easy access to the polling places. We should not throw up unnecessary barriers to voting. I don't think that we need to drag people into the polling place. It's a voluntary process. Uh, but we should also make sure that we have the utmost integrity in the system. 
Right now, our election system allows the creation of identities on the spot in the polling place with the combination of vouching and, and election day registration. Impersonation fraud is a misnomer, especially in Minnesota, because you don't need to use an actual voter's identity to obtain a ballot fraudulently in Minnesota. I can walk into a polling place with someone to vouch for me and say that my name is John Wayne, and they're gonna say, here's your ballot, Mr. Wayne, and I can do it over and over and over again. One person can vouch for up to 15 individuals in a polling place. Is there evidence that this has been a problem? Yes. From Minneapolis in 2010, uh, a, a university precinct, I forget, I forget which ward it was, it was Lutheran Church, uh, had organizers with Organizing for America stationed in the polling place, systematically vouching for people that they did not even know. They were caught by election judges and poll challengers. It's being investigated by the Minneapolis Police Department at this point. Uh, so we do have problems with our vouching system. I think everyone instinctively can see the gigantic hole in election security that that creates. This voter ID amendment will address that and keep it easy to vote. Mm -hmm.